And now it is my tremendous honor and pleasure to welcome John Paul Lederach here today. So I think I kn you all know the official bio, but I'll give just a few of the high points anyway. So Dr. John Paul Lederach is a professor of international peace building at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame and a senior fellow at Humanity United. He's provided consultation for peace building efforts in Somalia, Northern Ireland, Colombia, the Basque Country, the Philippines, Tajikistan, Nepal, and East and West Africa. He's helped develop and lead hundreds of training programs in conflict resolution, transformation, mediation, and peace building in 35 countries around the world. He's worked in international reconciliation for more than 30 years and has developed training in conflict transformation and provided direct mediation and support services for reconciliation efforts in some of the most violently conflicted regions across five continents. He's consulted with the highest level government officials and national opposition movements in settings such as Nicaragua, Somalia, Northern Ireland, Colombia, Nepal, and the Philippines. And he's the author of 22 books and manuals and numerous academic articles, including The Moral Imagination, The Art and Soul of Building Peace, Building Peace, Sustainable Reconciliation in Divided Societies, Preparing for Peace, Conflict Transformation Across Cultures. That's the official biography. <laughs> Informally, we know that John Paul is an artist and a poet of peace building, a moral voice for our field, and an inspiration for generations of young peace builders. I'll tell you one story of, of one of our wonderful interns named Hannah, who was very instrumental in setting up this conference but couldn't be here this week. And when we were talking about welcoming John Paul Lederach as a keynote speaker, she got pale for a moment. Mm -hmm. And she said, Melanie, I have to tell you the story. She said, I majored in something completely different in college. And my roommate just suggested I read this incredible book that she was reading called The Moral Imagination. And I read it and immediately switched my major and applied to graduate school at SIT, and it altered the course of her career. For me personally, when I was working at the Hewlett Foundation um, in very early 2000s, I read an article that John Paul wrote on the structure and process gap, which informed the whole way that I thought about grant making, that peace building was not only focused on process, but how do we start to look at development and institutions um, at a time when really no one was talking about that. So, and then much more recently, taking in all of his wisdom about the moral imagination of peace building and decades thinking, what it means to move beyond the projectization of peace, which you do in little you know, 18 month intervals, to think about much broader 10, 20, and 50 year sweeps, which is one of the things that he'll talk about today. So I felt that I had to bring a copy of his most recent book on memoirs of Nepal, Reflections Across a Decade, because it is so beautiful that not only does it cover very deep areas of wisdom about a decade-long peace process, but these photographs and portraits of the landscape and of the people, it's a remarkable format. And in fact, my initial copy was so written on and dog-eared that John Paul brought me a new copy today, so thank you. But I thought I would read just one paragraph, and I could have chosen one on almost any page, but I thought this was just, and it was, it was almost at random, but not quite. But he writes, sometimes I describe this feeling as, I like, uh, describe this as feeling like Alice in Wonderland. The shift between such different realities in the same country felt surreal. In the morning, I could be at the Agricultural Training Center in Bhaktapur, working with people on local conflicts, from forest and water user groups to landless Mukta, Kamaya, and Dalit castes, we sought to understand their most recent learning and dilemmas about how to evolve a mechanism for holding constructive local dialogue in the midst of volatile situations. These were intense discussions because the conflicts they were addressing could so easily become violent, and they always involved local people's immediate survival needs. In the afternoon, I could be sitting with politicians discussing if, when, and how the Constituent Assembly should be dissolved, or whether a national roundtable should be taken um, seriously if significant political forces remained outside the elections. 
And I thought this so be beautifully captured how you experience both the very deep local level personal kinds of mediation with the highest level top down structural issues, which was one of just one of the themes running through this book. So it is a great pleasure to welcome you here today, and we very much look forward to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Melanie, and it's a real honor to be with you this morning. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces, so I hope I have a few minutes to at least say hello to a few of you. Uh, I'm going to focus my comments this morning mostly on this uh, recent experience in Nepal. Uh, it, it came with, uh, that book actually was requested by the foundation that I was um, connected to. Uh, originally as a white paper. They, they wanted a white paper on all the things that had been learned across uh, 12, 13 years of that work. And I said I'd rather write a memoir uh, because I think a memoir permits you to interact in a different way. So half of that book are the faces and stories of the people I worked with. And half of them are reflections about the challenges of working in a setting when we started that was in um, open civil war navigating through uh, a comprehensive peace agreement, a very slow, extended, and difficult period of implementation, and a lot of deep disruptions that were emerging uh, at community levels as people were navigating out of that. So I've, I've chosen three areas that I'd like to focus on, but I want to give a small backdrop to how this started, because it initiated in a... Um, well, the opening chapter of this book is called The Phone Call. And I don't know if any of you have had the experience that when you get a phone call from somebody, you don't know where all those things might eventually lead. This one came from Karen Bennett, who was the, at that time, International Program Officer for the McConnell Foundation in Northern California, a foundation I'd never heard of. And a good colleague and friend of ours, Bill Urey, I think many of you would know him from the Fisher and Urey books, um, he uh, had connected with a call that Karen had made and said she wants to have an opportunity to talk with us about the foundation's potential change of direction in Nepal. So uh, I've suggested that you join us because you've done a lot more work at the grassroots level than I have and some of what they're talking about is very grassroots. So we get on this phone call. Karen is in California. A colleague of hers, Dumantapa, is in Kathmandu, and Bill and I are sitting around a phone uh, outside of Boulder, Colorado. Uh, it's a short phone call, a couple of questions about the possibility of a foundation moving its work from mostly development activities into peace building. And Duman was explaining very, very briefly the challenges that they had had with the a peace process that had fallen apart two times, a dialogue process between the Maoist insurgents, the then palace and king, and the, um, uh, the political parties that were mostly in the street at that time. And at the end of the call, end of the 10 minutes, Karen said, the real reason we're calling, as you know there's always a real reason behind the call, <laughs> is we, we wanted to know if, if you would have any time to actually sit with us and think through this. So Bill and I checked our calendars, and this was like a Monday or a Tuesday. The only weekend that we were going to be in Colorado at the same time around our homes was that coming weekend for about the next five or six weeks. So we said, well, it doesn't look too promising. This weekend is what we have available. Other than that, we, it had to be a couple, three months out. And she said, will you give us Friday? And we said, you're kidding. And she said, no. And so, uh, by Friday, Duman had come from Nepal, Karen had come from California, we were joined by Mark Gerzon, and it was just a small group that listened to the very arduous, difficult process of how the negotiations were collapsing. How do you end a civil war? Uh, there were a couple of pieces of advice that we gave at the end of that day and a half of conversation. They were pretty simple. I think the most significant one was um, probably in the direction of there will be an enormous amount to do 
so it's well worth your time to look at it. But if you decide to change directions, don't do it for less than a decade. Think at a minimum in decades. And we assume that was the end of the conversation. Two months later, I get a call back from Karen Bennett, and she said, uh, I've gone to our board, um, Redding, California. This is a foundation that has one, at that time, only one international initiative. All the rest of their philanthropy was done in about a three-county area around Redding, California. I've gone to our board and made a proposal that we shift our emphasis into working more constructively at conflict and peace building in Nepal. And I made the proposal that we do this for a minimum of a decade. And the board approved it on one condition. And the condition is um, that you agree to accompany us. So I'm calling to ask, will you agree to accompany us for a decade? <laughs> Now, my wife, who took most of the photography in this book, by the way, um, my wife Wendy was in the room next to me, and I was kind of shivered thinking around how exactly I was going to navigate multiple negotiations on this decision. <laughs> but um, it was the first time I had had my bluff called, because I literally have been talking for a long time that most of the places that I have worked that are coming through and out of civil wars are not well served by a project mentality. And that it requires a much more expansive time horizon and a capacity to think more strategically about the nature of change and how change happens. And your particular and distinctive advantages within a very complex set of dynamics that are happening uh, how you locate what to invest in and how you stay with it. And that those things require more than the content of what you focus on. They require a quality of relationships that you must commit to for a much longer period of time than we're typically accustomed to. And now a foundation said, will you accompany us? Another term that I have been talking about for a long time. And so um, from that phone call, the decade translated almost into 13 years. I still get phone calls almost um, once a month from people that I've worked with there, but it has been a, a very interesting uh, and revealing journey. For me, I focused a lot of the work that I was doing to give priority to a place that I was going to spend a lot more time and going much deeper. And I would like to take a few minutes to describe a few insights, things that have bubbled in me since this experience around the people that I've worked with. I have a PowerPoint that is exclusively um, photography of people that have been close to these processes. So, the first one that I'd like to talk about is that it took us a while, but we eventually landed on one of the areas that McConnell would invest more deeply in, and that uh, principally was around rural women and the experiences that they had had, especially in the districts that were the hardest hit uh, by the Civil War. A lot of the women that we had opportunity to work with were coming from contexts where the men, and the younger men in particular, had often left. Many were migrating out for work. Others were drawn into different sides of this conflict. Uh, and many of the women in certain districts, three or four of them, uh, were widowed, came into what they call the condition of a single, um, a single woman. They don't like to use the word uh, widow, particularly in, in Nepal. And a couple of the people that were on our Nepali advisory group, we formed a small group to help us understand that it was a very eclectic and interesting group of people around how and where we should move in this situation. Uh, a number of them became involved um, 
with some challenges around the reconciliation between women who had lost husbands to different sides of the war but cohabited a similar district or a set of villages where they were now living. And that began a process of something that became really, really interesting for me and for the people that we were working with. Uh, the approach typically for a lot of the work around um, women's involvement it, it, it included workshops that would orient themselves towards women's rights, uh, towards understanding what existed in law, uh, toward uh, gender-based violence issues, a whole range of those kinds of elements. But there was a feeling that the women that we worked with had, which was that um, much of that was coming from a more elite level into local communities in the form of sort of content delivery around things you should know. Yet these women had lived through extraordinary experiences. Uh, to be rural, low caste, and a widow puts you at the very bottom of almost any echelon of significance within uh, the Nepali circumstance. And to survive is itself uh, an act of creativity. They're enormously creative in how they find ways to even make their way through their daily and weekly and monthly needs. So the proposal was to see what would happen if instead of starting with a predetermined workshop, you began with women telling their life stories. And that you would do that in a way that you would select sets of women working with the women's ministry, with local groups that were there, identifying women who in particular had come to be respected in the local community against all odds. In other words, that everything was stacked against them, yet they still in this local community were women who were held in some esteem. And that those women who would be invited to speak and to tell their story would invite younger women, 16, 18, 20 year olds, to listen to that circle of story. So uh, the women that were primarily involved in this from our advisory group um, first tried it out on themselves. They said it was very, very challenging to tell a life story. And they learned by their own doing it, things that they might do to set this up. And they began a process in which they received consistently a couple of questions from every single group that they worked with. Question number one, what is a life story? Question number two, do I have one? Question number three, where do I get it? <laughs> it was uh, an extraordinary insight, actually, that the mindset uh, that my life would hold something of merit and wisdom that someone else would want to sit with was so foreign that they understood it initially as a commodity that they had to be trained in. What came to pass, essentially, was that life storytelling uh, became sort of the stamp of this movement became the way that it was known. Once women started to tell their stories, they couldn't stop. Often in circles, you see the picture here of one of the group activities around a woman having just completed her story and the others holding the space for what that meant for her. These were powerful. They have subsequently published uh, two books capturing some of these stories. They've done digital stories that are now moving toward the capacity to bring photography and the actual voice into this. Uh, I think I, for maybe one of the most moving things I experienced was three of the women coming to Kathmandu who had never been to the capital city and reading their story to a large audience. Um, women who could barely read and write were now able to voice what they had experienced. So what are some things that I take or that bubble in me around this? I find that in 
the world of research and academics and our INGOs, uh, we talk a lot about narrative. But in this particular process, my sense was that there is a difference between understanding narrative and embodied narrative. And that much of what was happening had to do with the ways in which story became embodied. And it required, it required a quality of presence for that to emerge, where listening was not done in order to extract a lesson or an insight. Listening was an act of presence and witness. The space where people had a chance not to have someone else hear them, but to actually hear themselves. And that something resonated very, very deeply when there was enough safety to bring forward that deeper embodied experience and to have it held in a sacred space of connection. I think this was essentially a process of reconnecting into basic humanity. That violence does so much to take away and numb the very sense of who we are as people. That we, one of the expressions we often hear is the notion that um, I was unable to speak or to feel. And that the first step of healing is very simply to feel like a person again. And that somehow the embodied space of holding the place for a person to speak from their experience was really significant. I think that this requires a kind of radical patience that we're not accustomed to. A radical patience that permits the retouching and the rise of the inner core that flows then into agency. We move too quickly to agency, to answers and activity, to outcomes and outputs. But the core of this kind of transformation was touching something that was much deeper. And I came to realize, even in my own work, how much our field has been dominated by template arrivals and extractive departures. We often look at the extractive industries with a bit of caution. We don't always realize the degree to which we participate in that very process. So the question that I've kept with me, how do we recuperate a sense that perhaps our greatest gift, our greatest gift in the context of really deep loss is the embodiment of presence. Where do we find the spaces to cultivate the quality of our presence and not just the capacity of our skill? The women are all waving to you. They're beautiful people. I wish a few of them were here. Going to a second area that I want to look at, which is around community mediation. When I first came to Nepal, there was a, the beginnings of what became a burgeoning movement around community mediation. It was uh, early funded by Hewlett. I think it may have dated back a ways, Melanie, to some of the work that you did. Uh, and then for a period of time, uh, the um, USAID and other European bodies invested but during the war period, it became difficult to sustain some of the activity and work of this very locally based effort at mediation. Uh, and McConnell made a decision to work in kind of a bridging way. It's one of those bridges that when you started to build, it turns out that the river was much wider than you expected. So it uh, was an effort initially to permit a period of a few years until a new source of funding emerged.
The Civil War disrupted much of that capacity, and so we stuck with the funding for more than a decade. Uh, this particular movement is one of those, I understand you have a basket of success stories. So this might be one of those baskets of success stories. If you look at the raw numbers today, um, there are more than 6,500 mediators working in more than 500 village development committees across Nepal. They have done more than 30,000 cases, and they have an 85% success rate in the settlement of those situations. All of this very, very local. Family, neighbor, land, um, a variety of employment issues, and about 90% of it very rural. Uh, some of this has come into the larger urban settings, but most of this is about, uh, began as an access to justice initiative. One of the things that emerged around this, working closely with the Asia Foundation, and here you have a photo of Preeti Tapa, dead center, who's been at the core of a lot of this work for the Asia Foundation, um, was that the extraordinary success rate of settlement begged the question, why is this working? Now, typically, when you have a certain success, you attribute to a range of factors, but what you attribute it to may not have anything to do with what actually is going on. And this was one of the things that I noticed early on in the observations and contact that I had with this the very early portion of this movement. Um, Ed and Therese Miller did an extraordinary job in the first couple of years in the opening training on this process. But what I found pretty consistently was that whenever you talked to people about what they were doing to explain the mediation work, they would use a professional jargon that sounded like it had just dropped out of Europe or North America. And when you sat and watched the actual mediation, there were a lot of other very interesting things going on. And so how was it that there was a disconnect from the practice and the language of explaining what it was done that was reflected quite often in the training materials? So we began a process that consistently in Nepal and all of the work that we did, we relied very heavily on some form of participatory action research. Uh, I've become deeply convicted that we have neglected this particular uh, kind of an approach in terms of the work that we do. And I think it has um, an ability to help people understand better what it is that they're trying to, to change, but also what it is that they know about their context in ways that helps to empower that from within the context. In this particular case, we actually involved ourselves with a pretty direct support for about 25 of the mediators to um, understand and learn some of the skill orientation that comes with participatory action research. They became teams of researchers who were also practitioners. They were studying themselves. Now, I'll tell you that it took quite a while for the turn to happen where people could conceptualize that studying their own practice was a well of deep insight and a resource. Because the tendency is that as you become more advanced and experienced, you look toward whatever the next level of advanced training is. So it could be um, you know, something that would come on multi-stakeholder dialogue. It could be the promise of mediation and what is transformative mediation. It could be a module on restorative justice. So you begin to bring in whatever it is that somebody else out there is doing that seems advanced and you add that to this portfolio of the people who are mostly doing the training. But you don't look very carefully at your own wisdom, your own process, your own practice. What we found in this was rather extraordinary, and I want to describe it with the first time that we met with a group 
that was redeveloping the materials that were starting to emerge from this participatory action research process. We had a group of 30 people who were going to help rewrite the training manual. First time that it was going to be written directly in Nepali, not translated. It's the first time that it would bring forward the concepts of what they actually do, the actual language they use in the local level. I pushed a lot on this. I said, I can't believe that you would say that to someone at a local level. And they said, well, we don't. I said, so why are you saying it to me? Why are you telling me that what we do is impartial and neutral if you use a whole other set of terms to explain it to somebody that's local? And they said, well, because it wouldn't make sense to them. I said, that's right. But they make sense of the practice, wouldn't they? Yeah. So why not have the training materials reflect the actual language the images, in fact, the whole of the training manual was captured in a series of images that an artist worked with uh, that make it much more accessible to the people you're working with. That was, that was our push. First time we met, we had 30 people, and I suggested that we do two lineups. I said, I'd like to start this session by having everyone who has done training at that end and people who have never done any training at this end of a big spectrum. Big lineup. So if you've done 200 trainings, you might be clear at the end. If you've done three or four, you might be in the middle. And if you've never done any, you'd be at this far end. The group lined up, and at one end, we had trainers who had spent nearly eight years doing training. And then I said, okay, now I want to do, redo this lineup, and I want everybody at that end who has mediated cases who has actually been on panels where you have worked through a mediation with a local community group. We lined up again, and it inverted exactly. At the far end were three women. All three of them had done more than 200 cases. They had mediated more than 200 cases. But they had never once been invited to do any kind of training. At this end, there were the trainers who had never mediated a single case. There were about 10 of them. Their entire work was to train people to do mediation. We spent a little while that morning talking about those two lineups. Because this is a common practice for Nepal that if you have a training program, you seek an elite training core of people who are capable of translating the knowledge that needs to be imparted, but you simply do not see. You invisibilize. You invisibilize the walking libraries that carry the wisdom of how things actually work. And this is one of our biggest challenges. It's not that anyone is poorly intended or doesn't do significant work, but it is that we overestimate the value of external expertise that is disembodied. You may hear me use this term a few times this morning. And we undervalue the wisdom of people who are very much involved in the actual practice. And because our forms of funding need interlocutors that can move between the international world and the complex local world, our very form of agency contributes to this pattern. What we found, I think, in this process was that there are and have been for quite some time some very interesting ways that the mediation practice was emerging to be relevant and successful. And that had to find a way to move into the training, um, the training endeavor, into the materials, into the approach. But it took quite a while to get there. One of the great advantages of a decade process is that you're not driven by the artificial time frames that are constructed outside of the realities of people's lives. You are building this in reference to the nature of the change that you are attempting to support. And I think this is probably among the biggest lessons that I learned from decade thinking. It's not that you change radically everything that you're doing. It's that you reconceptualize 
how you are alongside of the changes that you're trying to learn about and how you are parts of systems that are very powerful and that you often, too often by my view, engage in some form of fiction writing. I find it in two areas. We do a bit of fiction writing when we write project proposals. And uh, I apologize to those that I'm about to talk to this afternoon about a proposal. But you, you fictionalize the proposal to lift up the great potential and to make the case, knowing that you don't fully know whether that's what's about to happen. And then you fictionalize portions of the reporting because you need to have access to continuing the learning that you have just initiated. But the project is ending. And these two ends create for us, I think, a lot of difficulty. And it has more to do, by my view, around um, the form of agencies that we have chosen through the project than anything else. Final word on this. What we were involved in, and it took the better part of six to eight years, I think has to do with creating a platform. A platform that has capacity to be more responsive to uh, the realities and the shapes and contours of the context wherein it has to live. Uh, this kind of a platform for me requires us to rethink the terminology of scale. I think that we have overestimated the notion of scale at breadth. We want to see how far it's gone and how many things we can count. But we have deeply underestimated scale at depth. And by my view, scale at depth means that you have to take the time to get deep enough that things root, make sense, and can be held by the people and communities that have to live with the initiatives and processes that are underway. These two are not incompatible, but when it comes to the effort to create a scale at depth, it's often misunderstood from the international community's eyes. And the hardest thing that I struggled with in the course of these 12 years with community mediation was not that Nepal was facing in and after a civil war fragmented communities. It was that we were facing fragmented international community endeavors. The incapacity to cohere around a strategic view of the change and the need to protect the particular projects that given national or INGO endeavors had created ways in which a strategic expansion actually could almost not happen at all. There is a lot of training going on in mediation, but I don't think it's strategic. I don't think that it reaches the real potential of what could be done. And I lay that blame far more at the agency that the international community uses to engage in projects than anything else. Those are harsh words, because that's part of where I come from. But I think it's the reality that we face. The third one, and here, I'm going to go to, uh, I have two people I want to finish with. This is Parvati Kumari, one of the young people that I first met in the mediation work. She's an extraordinary woman. She also became involved in the third area that we worked with, which was a, an initiative around uh, natural resource conflict transformation at the local level. Um, Parvati is uh, has an extraordinary personal story. I mean, I'll just say a word or two so that you get a flavor of these last two people. Um, she comes from an area that was impacted by the war. She lost her husband. She's from uh, Dal uh, the Dalit caste, which is the, one of the lower, the ones that's known as the untouchables. Um, she was the sole breadwinner for uh, her family. She lost her father a year after her husband was uh, died. So she was the breadwinner for her mother and her children. And um, she was making about one dollar every two weeks. And at the very edge of survival. In fact, when she tells her story at some depth, she will reflect back to the day that she had 
purchased a small vial of poison that she was going to put in the food of her family to end the misery. And somehow uh, that night she couldn't do it. Uh, at some point she was invited by a friend to come to a mediation training. And she had no idea what the word mediation meant. She only knew that it had a per diem for her travel and food that she would pocket that was about three times as much as she would make in a two or three week period. In the course of that opening event where they were asked to do things, um, she did whatever they asked. And for me, it was a deep revelation to hear her say that one of the people involved in the facilitation said a very simple thing. You're good at this. You're good at this. Change your life. She, um, she's about, I would say, four foot eight. I have watched her wade into groups of more than three and four hundred people in community conflict and command the ability of people to come together in dialogue. She's an extraordinary woman. Sometimes I think that we lose sight of um, that maybe the best things we do are actually the little things. You know, just a, a word of encouragement, a word of support, an offer to be alongside someone. Those are not easy to put in your proposals. You don't get very far when you say, I'm planning to encourage people. <laughs> I'm, I'm planning to spend side days alongside of people. And I have some belief that this may make a difference. But I have to say, people that I've with, worked with in Nepal, pretty consistently, it's one of the elements that makes change possible. In this particular process, the natural resource, we had worked for some years with some very interesting national movements. They have odd names, like the Federation of Community Forestry User Groups. So a community user group around forestry is that locally a group would be responsible for the protection and use of a particular area of forestry. And this may sound kind of crazy, but Nepal's had a lot of deforestation, and so rebuilding this capacity was a big part of survival for a lot of rural communities. Many places still use wood, basically, as the form of cooking. And so when these things disappear, it becomes difficult. When they become contested, it becomes a fight for survival. When you come out of a war period and there is light weaponry available, conflicts over water, forestry, and land can rise rapidly into escalated violence at local levels beyond control. Uh, this forestry user group was an extraordinary example of what I would refer to as positive deviance that went uh, viral. They started with about 15 to 20 people with the idea that they would have a local group and over the course of about 12 to 14 years there are now somewhere between 6 and 7 million people that participate in a country of 24 million people. So you're looking at a third of the adult population of Nepal is participating in the Federation of Community User Groups. And we found this to be kind of an extraordinary set of things to try to link in and understand. The process was one that took us the better part of this decade to slowly but surely learn our way into. And it started with about 30 people. 30 people who came from uh, three different groups. The forest user groups, the water user groups, and the Mukta Kamaya, who are ex-slaves or landless people. Why? Because a lot of the conflicts initiate over the use of access to land and use of forest and water, 
are coming from people who those protecting that area would refer to as encroachers. But the encroachers are coming from displacement in the war period, and they're coming from uh, a phenomena, particularly in the border areas between India and Nepal, from ex-slaves, in bonded laborers, being released as whole families, whole communities, with no real place to go. And where they go is to locate a forest for cooking, water for survival, and some place they can put up cardboard huts overnight. And then fights begin. And this becomes a repeated phenomenon that can become very powerful. And many of the ways that the fights happen over land and forestry and water have not been well handled in a context of a country uh, who has not had much of an infrastructure to support the local needs. And this is where Nepal in particular has suffered a lot. We used uh, a couple of interesting strategies around, again, participatory action. We did not start with a model of how you might hold a community dialogue. Uh, we started with spiders. Uh, if you've read The Moral Imagination, you know I have a particular fascination with spiders and spider webs. I know some of that makes you shiver if you don't like spiders, but bear with me a minute. Um, we literally went out in the first couple of sessions with ideas like these. First, it was going to be about a 24-month period. We were going to meet seven times. People did not come as individuals. They came embedded in a team. They came from seven different districts across the country. The teams were tasked with doing actual engaged work between sessions. And whatever they ran into, they brought back to the next session. So the next session opened always with all the dilemmas that had to be faced, all the reasons why nothing was working. And then little by little, we would figure out how to respond to it, drawing from somebody where it did work or ideas that those of us had that were working outside. I had a co-facilitator, uh, Amit Dakal, who was a former student of ours at Eastern Mennonite. Uh, is an extraordinary person. Uh, it was one of, the most, one of the best experiences I've ever had of co-training. I would say one sentence, and he would talk three or four paragraphs. Uh, he, but essentially, Amit carried the contextualization of whatever questions or ideas were emergent. And it was an extraordinary thing. We had typically in that group between seven and eight languages from Nepal, so it was navigating across multiple layers of coming down and back in again. Uh, about the third session, we all went out and started looking at spider webs. How spiders make anchor points that go way out that you can't see. Nepal has extraordinary spider webs. Some of them run for miles, so you can really find something worth looking at. But the anchor points are these threads that are the first ones laid, and they go to the furthest, most strategic points of a given space. And they aren't that visible initially. You have to watch where they're at. You, you, you notice just by watching a while that the most important thing about the web is not the beauty that it has when it's finished, but the actual movement of the spider. And those movements are captured in two or three things. They come from the far anchor points into the center, so you've got periphery to center. You're trying to locate where those key places and people might be that are tied into the situation. They are constantly moving around. So there is a circular movement. Uh, if you want to put it in a more academic term, I sometimes say they are itinerant and iterative. They travel. They don't invite people to their space. They go out to the space they have to link to. Now, obviously, once they get the web up, they're inviting a lot of stuff to come in to eat. But it's very interesting, this movement of circularity that is a constant, so iterative means it's not about a one-time conversation. It has to happen over and over again. And it's going around and around and around, but the spider is actually traveling to those spaces. And what we worked toward was the idea that a small team of people from the conflict itself so when you had a water conflict, the communities that are down canal and up canal that are in conflict, you find one or two from each of the groups that are affected, and that little group travels. They actually move around the space. When we come over to your space, 
You're the person from that group, you open, you hold the conversation, and the rest of us listen. But when we go to your space, you open, and the rest of us listen. And they began this process of just simply circulating. And as they began to circulate, the conversation they had was like leaving a little thread every place they went, until eventually it would come to a place where they could ask questions like, so what do you propose we do in order to talk with each other? In other words, they were thinking about a kind of a process design rather than a proposal for a solution. That took a long time because a lot of the ideas about ways you handle conflict is somebody gives a solution. This was a very different orientation where you begin to ask people to suggest what it would be possible to do if they could agree to come. What, would they, what could they agree to? And that led to a whole process. Eventually we had this big picture that we drew out that was like climbing a mountain path. They call it the mountain path. Now, if you've ever been in Nepal or high mountain areas, you know that roads don't run straight up a hill. They run in switchbacks. And the switchbacks come very close to the last one. And that's that iterative process. But eventually you get to a place where you have greater clarity about what you're looking at. And it permits them to experiment, permitted them to experiment with large scale community meetings where the, that were agreed to and facilitated by people embedded in the conflict itself. In other words, it's a form of mediation without an outside mediator, a form of facilitated dialogue without an outside facilitator. This was arduous and difficult. Uh, one of our greatest uh, uh, interlocutors was this fellow here. His name is Balu Chowdhury. He comes from Kailali, which is toward the far west along the Indian border. Now, I remember the first time that Balu really jumped out at me was in about the second session of our first of these eight go-rounds where we were experimenting and trying to learn about the process that we were yet under design, and came back from lunch, and Balu was the person who volunteered to do kind of a, um, a you know, a, an activity that would liven us up when we were about all to fall asleep in the 102 degree heat. And he stood in front of the group and he started to sing. And I had no expectation that this guy would have such an extraordinary voice, but he just, sang a song that was just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it, I couldn't understand a word. It was lilting that sort of Hindi, Nepali form of music which captivates you. And then, um, all of a sudden in the song, he began to choke up. I mean, really choke up, a deep, guttural, chest-held choke. And the room got just absolutely dead silent. Everybody turned heads and looked very carefully because it seemed like, as you know, music can be deeply moving. And it seemed like he was being moved by something and he was about to break down into tears. And then all of a sudden he picked up and off went the melody. And then back down into these guttural gasps and then back to the melody. And later in the day when he'd finished at tea time, tea time is always a time you learn. I, I, I have a proposal for all training purposes from here forward, uh, I suggest that we do 15 minutes of input and two hours of tea time, because <laughs> tea time is when stuff happens, and you get into conversations, and people ask the questions they're not about to ask in front of everybody else, and you go on a walk, and you try to figure out what's going on. So we, with Balu, and we said, what was that song about? And he said, oh, that's the song that my community sings. It remembers the night that we were released from slavery. But that night that we were released, that freedom, there was nothing greater than the experience that lifted us, which is the melody that soars. But when we left that night, it was raining. It was muddy. We had nothing on our backs. We had no food. We had no place to go. And there was nothing so low and depressing as not having a place to be. And he said, that's the song we remember. He's Mukta Kamaya. He's the face of modern day slavery. Now, Balu became extraordinarily important 
for our process because he was a person who had come through the process of his own community being called encroachers, landing at a place where they put up cardboard huts, trying to find wood to cook, trying to locate water, while being in conflict and chased by people who were protecting those areas. And he found a way to be invited in to this big federation of forest user groups. So here's a guy who, bringing forward some representation of his community, they said, Balu, you go, you can talk a little Nepali, you go. You try to talk to these people. He found a way to navigate into acceptance into the enemy group. And now he's a part of a process trying to figure out how communities can handle conflict. And he came about the third session and said, none of this is working, and I've got a problem. And we started from there on forward. We started calling this Balu's Dilemma. Because it wasn't just Balu's Dilemma. It was everybody's dilemma. And here's what he said. I I've been trying to work with a group of Mukta Kamaya and a forest group. When I go with the Mukta Kamaya, they say, Balu, you're one of us. You have to defend us against them. And we want you to go there and get us what we need. And then when I go over where the forest user group is at, they say, Balu, you're now one of us. You have to defend us against them. And he looked around the room and he said, who am I? He said, I don't know who I am anymore. He said, am I a member of that group? Am I a member of that group? Or am I a nothing? I'd like to send Balu right here to Washington, D.C. sometimes. <laughs> He's, he is articulating exactly the dilemma of what is required if you are to be from and with a community that is in conflict. To be true to yourself, to retain relationships while experiencing the pain of fear, of exclusion, of hardened positions and demands. What we discovered, and this for me was one of the, I think, most significant discoveries of the 12 years, most of the people that we were working with, we thought we were doing something we would call peace building. What we discovered was that it was about how you accompany the rise of leadership capable of developing a wider collective imagination that stays true to their identities, but can stay true to the principles of respect and dignity of others. And that, I think, was particularly powerful in the case of the, National, the Natural Resource Conflict Transformation Group. They started discussing much of what they were doing according to the metaphor of the national soup, which is called kwati. Kwati soup, which is spelled in English translation, K-W-A-T-I. Kwati is um, a, a nine bean soup. And the process that they describe that they work with is like cooking kwati. Developing a community dialogue is like cooking kwati. So you have nine beans, but every bean requires a different preparation. Some beans you have to ferment. Some beans you need to boil hard before you put them in. Some beans you have to only drop them in when the soup itself is ready to go. So every bean is different. But when you drop all those beans into the soup and they cook together, you have this that happens. Every bean still has its flavor, but a bigger flavor is emerging. And that's how they understood this conflict transformation initiative. I think the two things I've really pulled from this, one I mentioned about accompanying the development of a different vision of leadership. The second was for me, with this particular group, the fact that after about the third or fourth year, when they had gone through a, a, a seven modular training and then had repeated another seven modular initiative where they themselves were the trainers and struggled with how to convey what they were working on. And when then they had gone out and begun a real process of the deepening of the practice, at about that third or fourth year, 
they started referring to themselves as a movement. We're not an NGO, we're a movement. And it helped me realize one basic principle. Never confuse a movement with a project. Movements are something different. They are about the ways that people will begin to rise and shift and orient themselves around things that they know need to be changed. A project with its orientation toward a particular outcome at a given time is misplaced if you're after the deeper transformation and you don't understand the significance of a movement. For me, this was a uh, a powerful lesson, a powerful lesson that we have too often not had a capacity to really visualize what is emergent impossible. And how to come alongside of that requires a kind of a patience and a set of lenses that permits us to watch and see how it is that people are truly seeing the context that they're in where they truly have issues that they're uncertain about, where they have ideas but nobody has fully understood what they may be, and how you encourage those to happen. This was, um, in a very interesting way now, nearly 10, 12 years later, they have three locations. They decentralized their movement. So they have three locations across the country. They are very close to now having completed 100 cases of natural resource conflict at local levels. Most of these involve hundreds of people. Some have gone upwards into eight to a thousand. Uh, they're large scale local dialogues. They take a long time to develop and come through. Um, and their biggest concern, two weeks ago, the head of this group called me and said, we, we've got two big problems. Um, we need help. We've got to think through this thing. The first is our local initiatives where people who have been fighting sometimes for 10, 15 years require a cabinet level approval. <laughs> I'm not sure I can fully explain how complicated it is on this vertical gap that we deal with in a lot of countries. But there are situations of land in a country with a weak land policy with an agreement over a land transformation in their peace accord that was never implemented with a parliament that's hung with a constitution that can barely be written and the ultimate decision around the situation of conflict requires some people at the absolute highest level of government to sign off. What do we do about the vertical gap? Uh, this is where not only do I go gray, I think, sometimes think about losing my hair. It is enormously challenging how much we are faced still today with the capacity to envision interdependency, but the incapacity to find the ways that it really works for the people who most need it to come forward. Um, the second piece of this, I think, was that I wanted to conclude just with a note about Balu's hat, which you may have noticed. He wore that hat until it fell off his head. And one afternoon I, I asked him, I said, Balu, do you know Jackie Robinson? Do you know who he is? And he said, no, I have no idea who he is. So why are you wearing this hat? So said, how did you get the hat? And he said, well, I, I was walking in the little village, and there's a store in the village that sells clothing. And I walked past the window, and this hat called to me. So he said, this hat called to me. So I went in, and I wanted to buy the hat. But it cost about equivalent in dollars, about $5. And that was more than a month's wages for me. So I walked out. A few months later, my brother got a job at the store. And he was given a wage for doing cleanup, sweeping, morning to night, all the rudimentary things that the store needed. And at the end of his first month, instead of the salary, 
he brought me this hat. And uh, so I said, Paolo, let me tell you who Jackie Robinson is. <laughs> that was a moment. That was a moment. When he finished, he, Nepalis have this way of swaying their head. He said, oh, this hat is more precious than gold. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I know that the room shares just our deep appreciation for those stories and this work, so thank you. And even though you gave me the option of asking the first question, I actually would like to throw this now open to the room so we can have a conversation with all of us. So we'll cluster questions. Um, we have about 15 minutes, um, so maybe three or four at a time. Do we have a mic that's going around? So, we have, yes. And please give us your name and, and where you're from when you ask a question. My name is Karambu Ringera. I'm from Kenya. And I work with an organization called International Peace Initiatives. Uh, currently, I'm a next generation leader with the McCain Institute for International Leadership, and I'm based in Kansas City, Missouri. I am here with the University of with. Wisconsin and Milwaukee. Um, thank you so much for a heart deep presentation. And I know you, you were in Kenya after 2008. Mm. And our next elections are next year. Mm. And we are already seeing the planting of seeds to prepare the ground for violence again in 2017. It seems to me that by now we should have probably learned as a nation how to prevent proactively um, post-election and election violence instead of always being reactive. So my question to you, sir, is what are some insights you can share having some context about our election uh, violence scenarios which are really very political, politically driven in terms of ways we can start being proactive uh, to prevent these scenarios mm. other than always being re reactive mm. when people lose their lives and their property. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Schipler. Uh, it's very nice to see you. I'm from Search mm. for Common Ground. Um, uh, I spent uh, years in Nepal and, and, and also had the privilege of accompanying the peace process still. Um, my question for you is, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between the local conflicts that you were dis uh, describing here and mm. the national political scenario, uh, which clearly had ma major influences over each other, and how that actually manifested in the work that you were doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, Beatrice? Hi, thank you, John Paul. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask a question students where I used to teach at a university ask me all the time. Yeah. None of what is said is rocket science to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. It's basic human interaction and being a bit less self-centered. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm being provocative mm -hmm. um, purposefully, but it's, it's not rocket science. You know, mm -hmm. It doesn't require big diploma to do that or even go into a university. Why on earth are we unable to change our practices? You know, you mentioned agencies and international agencies, but they are made of human beings. So what, what is happening there? Why aren't we, we talk about conflict transformation, we talk about transforming others, why aren't we able to transform ourselves? Mm -hmm. And one more, over here. And I'm sorry, I can't see everybody from where I'm sitting, so I don't say your name. <laughs> 
Okay, Sarah, yeah. Um, thank you so much. I'm a big admirer of your work. I also just want to take this opportunity because you've really focused on local peace builders to really acknowledge the local peace builders in this room. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they can stand up. One is a very dear friend of mine that has done such amazing work in Nepal, Pradeep. But I'd also like to recognize the other local peace builders in this room. Yes, mm. With that being said, I'm actually going to do a follow-up uh, question that Beatrice had, and I fully agree with her, I fully agree with what you said. How can we, I'm, I'm a person that like, I want to know how, I want to know what, how, what can we do to talk to international donors? And, and there's some in this room as well as private donors. You talk about we need 10 years to really make a difference. Well, USAID only, and I think State Department only allows for five years of funding. So what can we do and what can AFP do to maybe facilitate these conversations with these donors, um, specifically government donors, so we can not only have longer periods of funding and not so project driven, but also be collaborating more because we just don't collaborate. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. So four questions, one on how to avoid election violence, mm -hmm. how to link the local conflict with the national political scenario, this not being rocket science, so how do we actually change? and then around um, how we can talk with donors. Mm -hmm. Do I have, do I sit here? No, you're fine actually with your... You oh, I got my, I have my helm yeah. mic, don't I? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, well, these are great. They could each serve as a semester-length course. Uh, <laughs> so I, I recognize that there's probably insufficient time to go to the depths that they, they merit. I think on Kenya, Kenya's been a place that I've have a lot of close friends and colleagues and uh, over the years been close to people. Dating back to, um, if any of you have seen the book The Moral Imagination, it starts with a snippet of a poem that I wrote. It was dedicated to Rose Barmasai. Rose was one of the people at the time in that period of the um, late 80s into the early 90s that was working with the National Council of Churches precisely on this question of repeated election violence. In the book I speculate that, that maybe more progress had been made than proved to be the case later. But I found her and other people that I'm, I'm certain from the way that you've raised the question like yourself, that have the, the deep intuition to recognize the patterns as they're emergent. And that these patterns have to do with forms of politics that is a winner take all, in which people believe that their very survival as a particular identity group or region of the country or tribal entity may be affected by the outcome and how the political system, not unlike the one that we're currently living in right here now in the U.S., has capacity at the levels of the national imagination to bolster and to mobilize fear in ways that deeply affect those patterns in intensive moments when it feels like a lot is at stake. Uh, I think that that ability, what you've already placed in your question, your question is excellent, is that you're, you're, you're putting on the lens of looking at this as patterns and systems and trying to understand how they work and how they have repeated themselves. And then to develop capacity of response that begins to shift some of the dynamics that continuously and very prevalently make election periods periods of high potential for violence and that once it's unleashed it can escalate very rapidly and become uh, almost uncontrollable and I think that's where the where our our challenge is is precisely what you're referring to as proactive but I think the proactive has to also move from awareness to looking at the particular areas where potentially the most significant change can be prepared um, and, I, you know, I, I don't have a quick recipe for that. I think a lot of the things that I saw in Kenya over the, the decades that I had some opportunity to observe it, um, it had these spider-like qualities. It had people that were capable of moving up and down the Rift Valley to the different spaces, to do it early, to develop the relationships that could be drawn on, that create a kind of a, 
a capacity for a social webbing that mitigates that rise, to know deeply when you see the pattern early happening and how it is that you work at that. The piece that I probably would add now that I am, am much more challenged by and continuously trying to think through is how do we develop a capacity for leaders to have the vision and the, the inner qualities that permit them to engage in this from local to national levels in ways that contribute to the mitigation of the patterns that shift into larger scale violence. And I think one of the things that, uh, so I, I now know on a couple of the other questions, I'm now a little bit on the other side of the equation because I'm a senior fellow with Humanity United that is working very closely at some of these issues around systems work on the one hand. Um, but on the other hand, we've been investigating, asking the question, what are the qualities of leadership that we need to, to nurture that um, permit um, leaders to have both strategies and relationships that do not permit the rise of escalating dehumanization. And I think when we place it in terms of equality, we begin to pinpoint some things that going to a couple of the questions that I think Beatrice and others were asking about, you begin to pinpoint things that we have assumed people will develop um, and that what we have to, we have to, will develop on their own and what we have to do is simply provide the capacities for the external skills and the analytical ability. Um, let's take one of those qualities. I think one of the qualities is what I would call social, uh, social courage. So, uh, typically in peace building, we would understand that courage is about the ability of someone like Balu to reach across the line of, of uh, enmity and to be in relationship with your sworn enemy. That's a, that's a form of courage. And often when we're engaged in developing dialogue in settings that have experienced open violence, it is a hard, difficult process to be willing to enter into a conversation with your enemy. That's a form of courage. And leaders are very nervous about it. I mean, it's a risk for a leader to step out if and when his community is not prepared to do so. Um, but there is another part to social courage that we have not fully comprehended, and it may be more relevant to your question. That form of social courage is the ability to stand up on principle with your own group of identity when they begin to engage in patterns of dehumanization. And I think it's a harder one because our very identity and our very survival in many cases is tied to the ability to retain that relationship within our group. But we see the pattern emergent in our own community, in our own group. And it's a very uh, difficult place for a leader to be where they say, this is not right. Though we disagree, we will respect the dignity of those with whom we fear. Now that form of leadership, I think, needs uh, spaces and capacity for cultivation that we have inadequately understood in most of our training and educational programs. We simply place these off into areas where we think, well, that will emerge. I think it requires, and here I'll go maybe to the question on the, um, the rocket science. Uh, it may not be rocket science, but it takes commitment. And I think those commitments are, are fairly clear. Uh, I, I think it takes commitment to have the spaces where there is a deeper, more honest form of reflection and mindfulness. You can call it whatever term you want. It's an ability to actually create the space where you find ways to touch a deeper inner core uh, that is vocational in nature. Vocational is different than a job. Vocational means that I'm, vo vo the word vocation in Latin tra traces to the word voice that I am touching something that is deep within who I am, that I need to understand and nurture, and that I need to see who I am as reflected in those that I'm with. And typically, we're unable to create that kind of deeper reflection. And I think those are the spaces 
that uh, increasingly we need. I, 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 I think it's possible to do in ways that we haven't done them. I have tended to gravitate toward wanting to have um, a little deeper space for what I would refer to as a, I often call these conversational retreats. It's about a conversation, but it's not a conversation that you're trying to have exclusively with another person or a group. It is about also the conversation that you have had difficulties having with yourself. And what I found over my years of teaching was pretty consistently, students would come in the office, and some years back I changed my office hours, I saw I put in my syllabus, tell me when you want to have a meeting, and we'll go for a walk together. So I started believing much more in walking, there's a long story behind that, but I think something really significant changes when you are shoulder to shoulder, side by side, and you're walking and you're talking. Because often what I found is a student will come in and say, I don't understand the concept of the vertical gap. And so I start explaining the vertical gap and then all of a sudden it goes to Kenya and it goes to my community and it goes to the fact there's an election coming. And it goes to the fact of why am I in this university when my people are dying? What use will this degree be for me? How am I going to do anything in this world that will make a difference? And the real reason they wanted to come into that office had nothing to do with the vertical gap. They wanted a place where they could have some form that it was safe enough to be acknowledged about the biggest and deepest questions that I am carrying and that I can't even let myself hear. They're trying to have a conversation with themselves and they don't have a place to get it and this I think is one of the areas where we we have to find better ways of, of, of bridging and so I have pretty consistently in most of the quotes training activity that I do I, I build in different spaces I, I may try to make the inputs shorter I, I, before we have a group conversation, I will often send people on a walk. I call it a walk and talk. Go 15 minutes out, one person say what you thought you just heard and what you're bothered by, come back, the other person's talking. And when you go out on a walk and talk and come back, there's a whole different atmosphere around the quality of conversation that you're having. I, you know, when we first at, at Eastern Mennonite, we were getting our program approved. This is the history on this, the walking thing. I'm, no, I'm getting a little unraveled here, so let me go for two more minutes, I promise. Um, we, we had to get approved by the certification of the boards that were overseeing the southeastern states. And when they came, we had a summer program that was in its early inception. We were just, I see Lisa and a few others that are in the room here. We were just very early on. And, but part of the concept we had was we wanted this program to be available to people who are actually practitioners who cannot take two years off to come to a degree program and that they could interact with a community of people that are struggling to find ways of learning about what they're doing. And uh, so summer program was looked at, and one of the comments that came back from the certification board was this comment, which sent me thinking for years since. They said, we are uncertain if your summer program will have enough seat hours. Now, I had never heard of the concept of seat hours prior to this, but I now understand what seat hours are, that if you have a three hour, master's level credit, it assumes that you have a certain amount of contact or classroom time, which is metaphorically conceived of as sitting in a seat that then demonstrates that you have enough hours of engaged learning to provide that three hours of credit. And ours looked a little fudgy <laughs> on what we were doing. We might not and so I started thinking, where, when and where in the educational system did we begin to think that learning had to do with the amount of time you spend in a chair? Uh, or that learning somehow merged from the bottom up in some form or fashion. Who knows what it was exactly that was going on with this metaphor. Uh, but if you go to any of the historic wisdom traditions, whether they're religious or traditional, there is a vast amount of evidence that a lot of the learning happened as people walked and encountered issues and problems, talked about and reflected on those as ways of building knowledge. That could be from Christianity through Buddhism, 
It can be along the lines of the sorts of things that happen in many of the indigenous uh, communities where walking and then seating have combinations of things that they're doing that I think actually have something to do with re-embodying education. And I think that's the rocket science. That we have too much created the mechanisms by which knowledge is somehow disembodied from the fullness of who we are as people. And we create a disconnect between our inner and outer worlds. And you may have noted I said how many times I used the word, the notion of embodiment. I think a lot of that narrative work that the women were doing was in part about the story that they were attempting to recapture, but it had much more to do with them embodying and re-embodying what had been taken from them. And that's a very powerful, very powerful process. Um, national to local, I have what, two minutes left or one or none? Should Go for it. Oh, go for it, okay. Uh, you know, I, I didn't go into a couple of the other areas of the Nepal work. I think my, you know some of this as well, but I had, um, when we first went to Nepal, I met with the people who, Duman Tapa was the person that relayed this story initially. It was about uh, a number of senior sort of elderly figures within the political scene in Nepal who were attempting to move between the Maoists, the palace, and the political parties. Uh, one, Damandai Dungana, was a former speaker of the House, from a centrist party, the Nepali Congress. The other, Padmandai Tuladar, was a, a leftist uh, human rights lawyer, very much involved in indigenous identity politics, uh, also a former minister. The, the two of them, as a small team, could kind of spider-like move between the Maoists, the king, and the political parties. And that's what had failed a number of times. That they had just brought together people to talk and the talks would fail. That, um, that set of people uh, following the Comprehensive Peace Accord, which came a few years later, uh, was designated uh, to hold a, an informal political space that permitted um, two to three of the top tier party leaders from across quite a spectrum of parties in Nepal to participate in a regular basis in an off-record informal engaged dialogue that came to be known as the Nepal Transition to Peace Forum. And I worked with that um, through about six or seven years. In the memoir, one of the things I write is that um, I was struck, in fact it was the paragraph that Melanie read there, I was struck with how difficult it is to find the ways to connect and link the top level of the politics, which in Nepal is ageist, sexist, um, and casteist. <laughs> uh, all the prime ministers have been from one caste. All the, they've all been primarily close, if not into their 70s to 80s. Um, some, you know, had difficulty um, Physically, they were facing end of end of life things. All were men, of course. Uh, that that tier of people that we worked with. So one of the things I was deeply struck by was how, in the informal space of dialogue, they could identify some of the deepest needs that, that really needed to be addressed, both at the political level and at the level of what they were hearing from their own constituencies. But to a T, they would say, the top leaders have to decide. I was always struck by this because I thought I was in the room with the top leaders. <laughs> you know, and there was sort of this notion of, um, it was sort of a feeling of paralysis that came around how to engage differently and this calculus, this calculus that constantly ran, the calculus that began with at the very top, will this decision be good for me? Will it be good for my party? Will it be good for my community of constituents. And the last question that was asked, will it be good for the nation? And that calculus made it very hard to find ways that the bottom could bubble up and the top could be responsive and the top could share the dilemmas that they're facing. And I think it created a lot of the, the paralysis that was there. I still think that on the, this vertical thing, we, we've worked pretty hard I mean, one of the reasons why we embedded the work on natural resource conflict with the federation of 
forest and water user groups is that these were large broadband movements in the country. Uh, for the, you know, FECO Fund, the Forest User, Community User Federation, they function nearly equivalent to the Ministry of Forestry. I mean, it's like they are a powerful, a powerful body. But they've had a commitment from the beginning, although it sometimes gets difficult to sustain, but they've had a commitment that leadership will rise up from the bottom. So you have to be a part of a local community group. A man, they committed to one man and one woman at every level of leadership. It was the only organization or entity in Nepal that I found that systematically committed to that formula. So from every local community group, two people went up, one man and one woman. That became the district. The district pointed two that went up to the region and on up. And that process meant that this movement had capacity for more fluidity. But still, you find how difficult it is when the infrastructures and the institutions have been weak to begin with and then have been doubly weakened by a civil war and then have been quadruply weakened, by my view at least, with the historic opportunity that Nepal has to reconsider how it will share its resources and powers for the complex and very diverse nation that it represents. So it was, I, I felt that it was among the things that I was most conscious of and most failed at. I, I, I just, it, it just was very, very challenging uh, at a lot of levels. Uh, some people have asked me, you know, people would often ask, uh, is the peace process about on course? You know, how long does it take, et cetera? And I always thought there were a lot of people who were thinking in reference to the peace accord and the two-year implementation they had originally agreed to. And I didn't think that was an adequate time frame. It turned out to be something closer to a decade in reference to the implementation. And then the, both, you know, the constituent assembly collapsed. They had to do a second election. Second election barely could pass a constitution. When they did pass the constitution, it ignited a lot of furor around the country around issues of exclusion and identity. Um, I think Nepal may be in a 500-year process. Uh, this is, I, I'm, I'm speaking in terms of a big picture. That, the, that the, uh, the, the questions of where they're located between China and India, the, the issues that have dated way back, the forms by which they are attempting to rethink who we are and how we will be together are deep questions. But I noticed those same impulses in this country. And I'm, I'm quite caught by it right now. I, I think I'm very, I'm very captivated by our current electoral virus uh, because it is, it is showing that there is literally no place in the world that does not struggle with what it means to develop a collective imagination in a diverse society. So could I issue a challenge based on that yes. exact sentence? Hmm. That is what was going through my mind throughout your whole talk was how we have different kinds of conflict, but when you mentioned the 30% participation in user groups, what would that mean here? And would you be willing, this is my challenge, next year, to come and to lead a session on how do we take these ideas of participation, of dehumanization, of leadership, and think about our own communities here? Uh, only if three or four of the grassroots people agree to join me. Yes, is that it? Do you accept and, our challenge? And two or three of the people who are probably in this room who are connected to State Department or another. <laughs> if that group agrees, I'd be very happy to w w work throughout the course of the year to get a deal. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for being here today and sharing your time with us. And we we'll look forward to continuing the conversation.